It is 2024, the year of Gordon, and I'm gonna pull up some of his crown jewel stats because there's people out there that still think that he's not in the Mount Rushmore of NASCAR. I digress because the 24 is a number that is known for success in NASCAR, whether it's wins, championships, and other milestone achievements. So the question for the 2024 NASCAR Cup Series season is what pit crew is gonna be the modern Rainbow Warriors? What storylines are going to bring the fire and flames to the series we all know and love? As well as what driver is going to catch a spark that's going to turn into a brilliant flame which is going to cause an absolute firestorm for his competition. NRF Productions presents the Spotter's Guide predicting the 2024 NASCAR Cup Series regular season. 2023 was an intriguing second season for Ross Chastain at Trackhouse. He had some big moments like his victories at Nashville and Phoenix the first time in the playoff era that a driver not in the championship has won the marquee final race. Although there were a lot of people in the industry that were starting to get sick and tired of Ross Chastain's antics, from Dover to Darlington, Ross Chastain was in the headlines every week for doing something overly aggressive. It got to the point where Chevrolet and Justin Marks had to have a talk. Ross Chastain's reputation was so low that he could have worn a dress and talked about his transition to girlhood, and I don't think anyone in the industry would have seen him in a different light. New sponsor Anheuser-Busch knows a lot about controversies, and they could be the sponsor to help repair Ross Chastain and really influence him how to be a better driver behind the wheel. Which for Ross Chastain in 2024, honestly, that's easy. He should be the driver that's smashing watermelons, finding a crazy loophole in a road course or her Bristol to try to gain some speed, maybe pull another hail melon and smash more watermelons. With Trackhouse Racing becoming more of an empire, now Ross Chastain has the responsibility to be a driver that can not only race smart but race aggressive, but he can also be the driver that can be the torch bearer for NASCAR as it hopes to get more popular in the near future. Austin Sendrick is a driver that is in the frustration stage of his NASCAR Cup Series culture shock. 2022 was what I call the honeymoon phase with Austin Sendrick immersing himself in the Cup Series for the first time. Wow, everything was so special. He won the Daytona 500. He was doing all this stuff with limited expectations as a Cup Series rookie. However, after that magical first season, that lavender haze is worn off. Unless Austin Sendrick has found this shortcut in the Team Penske shop, he isn't going to avoid seeing the two NASCAR Cup Series championships every single time he walks through to get to his desk every single morning. That's got to be frustrating as a driver, and to add more pressure, Rusty Wallace, Kurt Busch, and Brad Keselowski once drove the number two car. However, maybe he can learn something from these drivers. Rusty Wallace, Brad Keselowski, and Kurt Busch, at one point, they all had to go through the Penske culture shock as well. These drivers helped make the number two a credible ride for three decades. Now, in 2024, reunited with Brian Wilson, who helped him win the 2020 Xfinity Series Championship, it is a necessity for Austin Sindrick to show that he will be the 2020's extension of that incredible legacy. So in NASCAR, if there were a teammate of the year award, it would be Austin Dillon. He was just two laps away from helping Kyle Busch cross off that one thing eluding his NASCAR Cup Series career. That was unfortunately the most useful thing that Austin Dillon offered us in 2023 because instead of Kyle Busch really pushing Austin Dillon to become a better driver instead, look at what we got. Austin Dillon scored 10 DNFs, all of them due to crashes and a 29th place finish in the point standings and it's insane because Austin Dillon fans actually think this is a normality for him when it in fact is quite the opposite. Well, one thing's for sure, Austin Dillon fans know how Casey Kane felt in 2015. Keith, you know, oh, watch out for Keith. 
Maybe this second year of Keith Rodden helps as the objective is to return to the playoffs for the sixth time in nine seasons, as well as steal another crown jewel. He's still got the Brickyard 400 and the Southern 500 to cross off his bucket list. If Austin Dillon can't turn the tide, I believe his age leads him down one of two potential career paths. Austin Dillon has had an active role at Richard Childress Racing, helping recruit Kyle Busch and Brody Kostecki in recent years. So maybe he is destined to step into that role like other drivers, Jeff Gordon, Jimmy Johnson, Denny Hamlin, and Brad Keselowski have adopted in recent years. Or, once as a participant in the Little League World Series, he could always join the St. Louis Cardinals as a starting pitcher. For the first time since Tony Stewart joined in 2009 to make Haas CNC Racing, Stewart Haas Racing, there will not be a NASCAR Cup Series champion driving one of the organization's cars. Now, in the art of matchmaking, Tony Stewart would have to swipe to try to find that perfect fit, and ultimately, he discovered Josh Berry. Barry was a driver that helped build up Junior Motorsports' late model program from the ground, and he was overlooked while drivers like William Byron and Noah Gregson immediately went up to Xfinity and the NASCAR Cup Series before Barry. Josh Berry is a driver that has taken an unconventional path to the NASCAR Cup Series and is going to be one of the oldest rookies that we've seen at least from this crop of drivers. What Stuart Haas Racing is hoping is that Josh Berry, being a racer, fits in with this group of racers on the four team featuring Rodney Childers. Josh Berry now has that opportunity to not only win races in the NASCAR Cup Series, but please, can he become the most successful graduate of Henderson County High School? I'm sick and tired of hearing about Travis Kelsey's girlfriend. It's got to be frustrating for you Kyle Larson fans out there because on one hand, Kyle Larson has the backing of Hendrick Motorsports, the speed, the resources to where Kyle Larson doesn't have to overdrive the car. And last year, we saw Kyle Larson check off milestone victories like winning at Martinsville for the first time and claiming the majestic Southern 500. However, Kyle Larson made a lot of mistakes last year like he would driving a Chip Ganassi racing car. Just look at Homestead, he pushed it too much going on pit road after he dominated that race. At the end of 2024, we might be talking about the year of Larson considering he's racing the Indy 500. He has the potential to cross off the Daytona 500 and the Brickyard 400 to make him the first immaculate driver in NASCAR since Kevin Harvick. But it's going to take less races of idiotic moves and more races where Kyle Larson shows his talent as well as Cliff Daniels being the modern day Chad Knauss. I'll tell you what, Brad Keselowski bringing the Penske touch has saved Roush. Before, Roush Fenway Racing was pretty much the Kmart of NASCAR. This was an organization living in the past, operating with 20th century technology, unable to hire decent workers, and the shop probably didn't have any air conditioning. I would hate to be one of the employees at that time. Not even two years later, here RFK Racing is as a respected organization in the garage, thanks to Brad Keselowski being an owner. In terms of the driver just looking at his stats, that reeks 180 in performance. Still, the 2012 series champion left a lot of wins on the table while the number 17 team with Chris Buescher won three races. Now, I don't know the RFK power dynamics, but if these two cars are equal, that doesn't look good on Brad Keselowski's end. For Brad Keselowski in 2024, the goals are pretty simple. Number one, win the Daytona 500, which would mean that he's won all of the marquee events in NASCAR, and then also perform like a NASCAR champion, close out races, and close the gap between he and Chris Buescher in the wins count. Corey LaJoy is known for his nickname, Stacking Pennies, which he did a lot in 2023. Every race last year, he would deposit a single race at the finish to his deposit, and by the end of the year, LaJoy finished the season without a single DNF. 
This deserves a massive shout out because while there aren't as many mechanical issues in today's NASCAR, this is the DVP era and you never know when NASCAR is going to either tow a driver back to the garage or call them out on the DVP because they broke a tow link. That's giving credit where credit's due because unfortunately, LaJoy's lackluster performance at Gateway in a Hendrick Motorsports car largely overshadowed anything else he did in 2023. So for Spire Motorsports, Corey LaJoy and Ryan Sparks are back to further build up a rapidly expanding Spire Motorsports empire. If Spire were a baseball team, they'd be the New York Mets. Gamebridge being their Steve Cohen, basically throwing whatever money's necessary at top drivers, race teams, and even spotters. Corey LaJoy this season will look to perform more like the first half of last season, although the end of last year, as well as Spire's expansion, questions whether or not this seven team is going to be up to an elite level in 2024. So Kyle Busch is now a fan favorite. Maybe it's because he has all the vices now as sponsors. Rebel Bourbon, Three Cheese, Own. All he really needs now is C4, which by the way, he would reunite with Skittles, as well as OnlyFans to sponsor him. Last year for Kyle Busch was a Jekyll Hyde season. He started out the season like 2008. He had everything to prove went out in one auto club to a chorus of cheers for some reason, then he got to Talladega, won that race, and then dominated St. Louis. It's a shame, I really thought this was going to be his year. I had him going to the championship four. Not only did RCR fall off a cliff in terms of just raw speed, but Kyle Busch made a lot of mistakes. Kyle Busch made just way too many mistakes, and it's obvious that he is still adjusting to the next generation car. This is year number 20 for Kyle Busch, and I believe, especially with Spire Motorsports buying out KBM, that we're actually closer to the end of Kyle Busch's career than a lot of people realize. If Kyle Busch can iron out some of his mistakes and win more races, he could easily extend his career until the end of the decade. However, if Kyle Busch continues to struggle with this next generation car, it might be a topic of conversation that the best days of Kyle Busch are in the rearview mirror. Hey, now that NASCAR is working with Netflix, maybe they can make a deal to where they have a Falling for Christmas 2 starring Chase Elliott. Because when he had that snowboarding incident, it's like the entire season fell apart for Chase Elliott. It reminds me of Jeff Gordon 2008. While he was still consistent, when Chase Elliott returned, he never got back to what he did in the season prior. Missed the playoffs, made an idiotic move at Charlotte, and didn't even lead a lot of laps. Now Chase Elliott, Alan Gustafson, and the entire nine team, they are focusing their efforts on doing good in this 2024 season. Number one, this nine team has to show that they can still compete with Larson and Byron coming off championship four appearances. And the second thing is that they need to do better in crown jewel races. Chase Elliott, year nine at Hendrick Motorsports, and he has yet to win a marquee race. Although, based on the numbers, February 18th, 2024 is perfectly lining up to be Chase Elliott's day of Daytona 500 destiny, kind of like Daryl Waltrip in 1989. It's important that this number 9 team comes out swinging because the longer that Chase Elliott struggles, the more we're going to question, do changes need to be made within that program? So Noah Gregson did a problematic thing in the number 42, got suspended, lost his ride, lost his fast food sponsor, and now finds himself with a top tier team in a black fire suit. Hey, this sounds awfully like the straight to DVD version of Kyle Larson's 2021 season. In hindsight, a character like Noah Gregson was never going to fit in with a team like the Legacy Motor Club. Noah Gregson just fits in better with a team like Stuart Haas Racing. And so far, it sounds like Noah Gregson has filled a void that has been vacant at Stuart Haas Racing since Clint Boyer left in 2020. He's really brought the fun and energy to a shop that hasn't had a lot to be excited about in the last three years. 
In addition, Noah Gregson is going to learn a lot from Tony Stewart. He's faced a lot of adversity in his career, said some politically incorrect stuff, done some controversial things, and I believe that with his guidance, Noah Gregson is not only going to become a better person, but a better driver behind the wheel. Like I said, he's going to struggle this season, but three, four years down the road, I believe this is going to be a beneficial move for everyone involved. It's interesting to see how Denny Hamlin has basically become the villain of the NASCAR Cup Series. Maybe it's falling by the stereotype of Toyota bad, Chevy good, and Kyle Busch, NASCAR's biggest villain the last decade, went from Toyota to Chevy. Although I've got to remind you that Denny Hamlin has beat your favorite driver over 50 times. However, when it comes to the championship, a lot of other people's favorite drivers have beat Denny Hamlin year after year after year. It seems like Denny Hamlin has tried everything, be super serious in 2010, let a little loose in 2014 and 2019. Try to have various rallying cries, act a little bit cocky, but in the end, it's been the same result year after year after year. So that begs the question, is 2024 Denny Hamlin's year? <laughs> yeah, right. Although, I will say that NASCAR would benefit greatly from having Denny Hamlin win the cup this year. I believe in the NASCAR Cup Series, you need the balance of heroes and villains winning the championship. It's what makes NASCAR compelling. And what do you know, three of the last four NASCAR championships have been won by drivers that have been unanimously loved by the fan base. I believe NASCAR would benefit with Denny Hamlin finally having his day of destiny in 2024. He's going to have to do this with a brand new race engineer, but I believe the 11 team is going to be strong. It's just a question of can he finally get past the hump? When you've had enough, when the crowd gets rough, gotta stand up straight, gonna rise like a champion. When your cloud goes dark, when you lose your Never ask a young man how many hours of video games he plays every week. Never ask a young woman how high her body count is. And you never, under any circumstance, ask a young Ryan Blaney why he was a ghost for all but six races last year. Ryan Blaney did not lead a single stat category, and yet he was the first driver to win the championship as a six seed or lower. Like in that Advance Auto Parts commercial, Ryan Blaney, after helping Joey Logano, said, Now, it's my turn and won the 2023 NASCAR Cup Series Championship. Remarkable to see Ryan Blaney rise to that occasion. Now, he enters his ninth full-time Cup Series season with a respectable career resume and, most importantly, momentum. We've seen instances like Kyle Busch in 2015, where a championship propelled him to the most elite stretch of his career. Or on the flip side, we've seen instances like Chase Elliott 2020, where he spends his entire championship defense playing second fiddle to his own teammate. Who will Ryan Blaney be after this 2024 season? A back-to-back -back Cup Series champion or Casper the Ghost? Chase Briscoe's 2023 season was ruined, tarnished, never to return to any normalcy again, at least in 2023, when Stuart Haas Racing stuck their hand in the cookie jar of single source next generation parts. They did all of this for a 20th place finish, so they didn't feel good spirited like that child stealing a chocolate chip cookie, but Big Daddy NASCAR got that paddle out and smacked the 14 team hard. It was a season-killing $120.250,000 penalty. 2024 gives them another opportunity to not be tempted by that delicious smell of chocolate chip cookies, which in this case is seeing all these exotic parts that could make them faster. They also have Richard Boswell, and you can argue that the team has the driver and the crew chief in place to be competitive. Again, like Barry and Gregson, the question is Stuart Haas Racing. So far, Chase Briscoe's career mirrors that of Martin Truex Jr. 
top Xfinity prospect, struggled in his first season, won his first race, and made a deep playoff run in his sophomore campaign. Then in year three, they struggle, get a penalty, the organization loses a ton of sponsors, and it's pretty much a nightmarish outcome. And if we're going by the notion that Chase Briscoe 2024 is going to be Martin Truex Jr. 2009, I have some bad news. At this point, if I were Chase Briscoe, I would just be hoping that I don't go 10 years into my career and only win three races. You know, a Rick Ware Racing driver and a depressed person have a lot more in common than you might think. Both are stuck in a shitty situation that they can't see themselves getting out of, and they are just anticipating the end. That is probably what Kaz Grella is going to feel in his 25 starts this season. It's going to be a lot of depressing sub 25th place runs with maybe a top 10 at a super speedway mixed in. Hey, at least he's getting an opportunity. Who else is getting the shot? Oh boy. Look, I get why Cody Ware is back. The charges were dropped, and this is a country where it is innocent before guilty. Therefore, we can't prove that Cody Ware did the outrageous things to his ex-girlfriend like alleged in the case. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's still Cody Ware, a driver that has shown no improvement over his Cup Series career and is only still in this business because of his dad and his connections, which is one of the most frustrating things about modern NASCAR. Honestly, much like what Colleague Racing has done with the number 16. Chris Rice probably approached AJ Allmendinger and sang, Hey now, you're an all-star by Smash Mouth, and then changed some of the lyrics around to imply that he's going back to the Xfinity series. It frustrates me because AJ Allmendinger is a top-level talent in the NASCAR Cup Series. He never really got to show what he was capable of on a top-tier team. And yet again, now he is going to be part-time, but on the flip side, there are some intriguing drivers that are going to be splitting the time in the 16. You've got Josh Williams, a driver that has raced his entire career in subpar cars, now getting an opportunity on a semi-decent car. And judging how he almost made the clash, he might have a couple good runs in him this season. Then you've got Shane Van Gisbergen in his NASCAR transition making a couple starts. So the colleague number 16 is yet again a rotational car. And believe it or not, this isn't the most frustrating thing that colleague has done this offseason. Controversial take, but Chris Buescher was not the most improved NASCAR driver of 2023. To actually improve as a driver, that means you have to get better at your racecraft. And based on the fact that he had a 17.8 average finish in a JTG Doherty car in 2019, the driver was never the problem. It was purely the lack of talent and the lack of equipment at JTG as well as Roush Fenway Racing, as we all know how they had 20th century technology for the better part of the decade. That is the reason why I called him for the longest time NASCAR's Mendoza line, even though he wasn't that bad of a driver. And what do you know, all it took was the organization strengthening itself from the inside and out for Chris Buescher and Scott Graves to throw it back to 2015, leading all of Cup in various categories including most laps completed. Now, with the strength of RFK, Chris Buescher can prove once and for all he isn't an underrated talent. He is now going to be a weekly contender for the next decade, maybe even become a Daytona 500 or NASCAR Cup champion by the end of the year. You never know. Martin Truex Jr. was fueled by anger of missing the 2022 playoffs and came out swinging in 2023. He did so well in the first 26 races to where he got the regular season championship and the corner office to see all the chaos brew in the NASCAR playoffs. Then we get to the playoffs where just everything seemed to go wrong. Martin Truex Jr. had a variety of issues, whether it was bad luck, not having any speed, or arguing with James Small over strategy like an old married couple would over just the dumbest shit. He collapsed so hard to where the 19 didn't even finish top 10 in points and missed the championship. So for 2024, we get another year full of stage wins and Martin Truex Jr. pondering retirement. And the things to keep an eye on if you're a Martin Truex Jr. fan is number one, whether he can check off two boxes in his career. He has never won a Daytona 500 and he has never won the Brickyard 400, which is now back for 2024. 
The second thing, can the 19 bounce back from an abysmal playoffs and perform? Because like Chase Elliott, there's going to be a lot of eyeballs on this team's performance. Because if this team falls off a cliff performance-wise, this is probably it for Martin Truex Jr. With Martin Truex Jr. at this point in his career, they're not going to make wholesale changes for a guy that's probably going to be out of the Cup Series in three years. Out of all the NASCAR Cup Series drivers, Martin Truex Jr. is arguably the one that absolutely needs to perform this season. Songs have a different meaning for everybody, but hearing For Whom the Bell Tolls takes me back to my high school days in track. The song blared over the speakers for the last race of the day, the 4x400 race, and it always struck me as a song of rising to the occasion in the midst of pressure and chaos. Ironically, I think this song encapsulates Christopher Bell, not just because of what he did at Phoenix. Let's take a look at what he did. Wide open, around the wall, in three and four, unbelievable. That meme is never going to get old, but Christopher Bell has built a reputation of winning when it matters. Plus, he's one of the most undervalued and forgotten drivers in the NASCAR Cup Series, whether it's not being in the original Netflix plan, not being featured in the Daytona Toyota Injector, or even myself not having Christopher Bell make the round of 12 last year. I am certainly not making that same mistake again, because come playoff time, nobody should doubt the capabilities of Christopher Bell and his ability to rise to the occasion and make it to the championship at least. The biggest obstacle for Christopher Bell isn't to shed those playoff demons. That's a good thing because there's a lot of drivers that just cannot get past the hump. For Christopher Bell, it's about having that breakout regular season because Christopher Bell, he disappointed a bit in the regular season last year. He had a lot of expectations, but only won one race. That was part of the reason why I even doubted him in the first place. The 20 team is definitely in that championship caliber that Denny Hamlin was talking about on Actions Detrimental because the driver, the crew chief, and the raw speed of the organization, it's all there. Now it's time for Christopher Bell to get rid of the inconsistencies and turn his pole awards into race victories on Sunday. Harrison Burton has been a ship without a sail these last two years based on the stunted growth he's had as a driver. When I pull up racing reference, you just have a ton of metrics that you can analyze and study. Wins, top fives, top tens, races at the finish. When you look at stats, there are some oddities like Corey LaJoy leading races at the finish, but the one thing that's consistent is that Harrison Burton's name is always next to Ty Dillon. That's not good considering Ty Dillon was the worst full-time driver last season full-time. His struggles show more and more that Matty D was not the problem, but instead it was philosophical differences. It was the Penske way. Kinda like the St. Louis Cardinals when they got rid of Mike Schilt. They thought this was the right move, but not even two years later, for the first time in my lifetime at least, the St. Louis Cardinals finished last in the NL Central. Yes, I finally know what it's like to be in baseball poverty. I digress, because Jeremy Bowens might be the guy that can act as a compass for Harrison Burton. The last time he aided a rookie driver at the Wood Brothers was Ryan Blaney as he helped him mature as a driver and get his first victory. That driver just won the NASCAR Cup Series Championship. The third year is usually the most critical because you have the experience and now there's a justification to potentially pull the plug and make a driver move. If Harrison Burton cannot get some wind in his sail, then he might end up like Cole Custer, which he probably wouldn't complain, because that would mean that he becomes the 2025 Xfinity Series champion. Logano is a two-time NASCAR Cup Series champion! Joey Logano Nation, I'd like to wish you a happy even year because this is going to be another fantastic year for Joey Logano. What you guys should expect from this season is another inaugural victory because we've got Iowa on the schedule now. 
Also, to the delight of absolutely everyone, 2024 is lining up to be just like 2020. 49ers versus Chiefs, Trump versus Biden. Aren't you so excited to see that rematch? Will you who shut is up, man? Listen, who is In all seriousness, this is perhaps one of the most pivotal even years for Joey Logano. Ryan Blaney just won the championship. Plus, you have to consider Joey Logano, he's starting to get up there in age. He's maturing as a driver to where he should be achieving a lot more with his experience. But so far, if I'm being honest, and this is going to sound a bit odd since these two have a history, but Joey Logano is the modern day Tony Stewart. Both drivers don't tolerate BS, although they do have a lot of hypocritical moments. Both drivers surprisingly only have won one of the four crown jewel races in NASCAR, and then you have to consider momentum. Arguably for both drivers, when they won their championships, they weren't necessarily the best driver, but the one that could capitalize on the momentum. Heck, even from a sponsorship perspective, Shell, Home Depot, and Dollar General have sponsored both drivers at points in their careers. Being a Tony Stewart isn't bad, but this is the guy that everyone touts as the greatest thing since sliced bread. There's not only a lot for Joey Logano to check off, namely crown jewel victories, but when was the last time the 22 really had an elite season? So if we're going by that logic and considering that he finished 12th in points while Blaney won the cup, and he had by far the worst Penske season since Austin Sindrick in 2023, I know Joey Logano is the even-year GOAT and has a multi-year contract, but if he has another horrible year, I could see him getting replaced by someone like Gregson in 2025 if things don't go well. Gotta love some copy pasta. You could say Bubba Wallace has the personality of a batch of McDonald's french fries. He has a lot of flavor and seasoning, but at times he can come off just too salty. By the way, I wasn't looking at Bubba's brand new McDonald's livery when coming up with that analogy. If you want my thoughts on this car, I'm simply going to give you a recommendation in the form of a meme. Because this is a complete 180 in performance from whatever last year was. And by the way, the Tyler Reddick one I originally liked, but uh, X ruined that for me. Okay, that was a side tangent, but I digress. Because 2023 was the first year where Bubba Wallace stopped making excuses and actually put in the work necessary to improve. He really leaned on Michael Jordan and Denny Hamlin, who are pretty much like family to him at this point. And as a driver from Alabama, maybe Bubba Wallace hasn't seen it firsthand, but he knows that you never turn your back on family. Dark jokes aside, Bubba Wallace posted career high numbers and outpointed five NASCAR Cup Series champions in the point standings. Bubba Wallace has done a fantastic job improving his racecraft, especially at road courses, but in 2024, he has a new challenge. He needs to try to not break down like the McDonald's ice cream machine in crucial moments. 2311 Racing with their flagship driver is making strides, and now he has the resources to go out and win. If not, he will have to say peace out to his 2024 playoff hopes, especially with NASCAR becoming more and more like the NFL, as you're starting to see more frequently teams might do really good in one year, and then the next they might be completely off. If you're a brand new NASCAR fan, I would say the driver that you need to jump on the bandwagon with is William Byron. If you're into Legos, William Byron, as showcased on NASCAR Full Speed, built the next-gen car and a ship out of Legos. It helps William Byron not only cope with the pressures of being a top NASCAR Cup Series driver, but also being at Hendrick Motorsports in car number 24. As documented in the open, this is the year of Gordon 2024. There is a lot of pressure for William Byron to make it the 24 in 24. William Byron, we all know about the story on his computer. Rudy Fugel has really elevated himself as a crew chief and Hendrick Motorsports as well, Hendrick Motorsports. Entering this brand new season, it's easy to see William Byron as the favorite, but then again, I want to be a contrarian here and step back a bit. 
in the modern NASCAR Cup Series, it's awfully hard to replicate having a great breakout season like William Byron had in 2023. Heck, you even look at recent examples at Hendrick Motorsports, like Chase Elliott in 2021, Kyle Larson in 2022. Both drivers couldn't replicate the magic, whether it was being second fiddle to their own teammate or making a lot of idiotic mistakes. William Byron might take a step back or maybe that loss in 2023 makes him even stronger in 2024. Either way, this is someone that you can easily latch onto whether you're an average Joe or you have even a pain fetish, for example. Because I'm telling you, every single time he wins this season, you're going to want to gouge your eyes out because of how awful almost all of his liveries are. Exalta, Raptor, Liberty, doesn't matter because when seeing the 24, you might be tempted to become like that one woman that had a fetish of being blind and willingly chose to blind herself because that was her childhood dream. I'm just going to say William Byron is in for a decent 2024. So if you tried to open Daniel Hemrick's Spotify account, which would require you to steal his phone and try to guess the password, I'm guessing it's 313131, but that's besides the point. His number one streamed song for 2023 would again be I Love You Poppy by J-Lo. Look, we all know why Daniel Hemrick is back in the NASCAR Cup Series. Money! Colleague Racing has shifted from the mentality of we don't care if the drivers don't provide money, we're going to figure that out eventually to, yeah, we need the money. For Daniel Hemrick, this is a massive opportunity because he's a more mature driver than he was as a rookie in 2019, and he has the experience with the next generation car. After that, Colleague Racing pretty much traded in a brand new shiny Chevrolet Impala and instead settled for a used 2013 Toyota Corolla. Colleague Racing has Come here, take all the money. But in terms of trophy hunting, well, it's more like top 25 hunting. Michael McDowell and Front Row Motorsports continue to level up as an organization. It's incredible how they went from a team that employed Kevin Conway to now an organization going out there and beating Chase Elliott straight up to lock themselves into the playoffs. Michael McDowell's performance at the Indy Road Course was the third most dominant win of the entire season. However, it must have been a massive ego boost for the 34 team to see Drew Blickenstorfer and Blake Harris both miss the playoffs after they thought, you know what, Front Row Motorsports, it's a stepping stone to get to a better team. The good news is Travis Peterson isn't going anywhere. He's here to further the progression of this program. The next thing to achieve on this team's bucket list is to win a non-super speedway oval race. Gateway, as well as both the Bristol Concrete races, are ones that McDowell fans should see as a possibility for victory given the laps and the finishes in those races during the next-gen era. Sure, the Indy Road course is out, but there are plenty of races for Michael McDowell to go out there and make the playoffs for the second year in a row. Michael McDowell has been rightfully renewed at Front Row Motorsports like teammate Todd Gilliland was. Front Row Motorsports, you almost had me. I thought that you guys were going to fail to learn your lesson as an organization when it comes to car number 38. It takes time and patience to get everyone settled in, to get the right pieces into place, and to abandon Todd Gilliland after two years for another rookie driver, even for how good Zane Smith is, just wasn't the right thing to do. Todd Gilliland continues to have a career that debunks the old ABC method, Arca Bush Cup method, to rising up the ranks as a driver. In 2023, he had the sixth largest difference in average start versus average finish. It's going to be interesting to see what Todd Gilliland can do knowing that he's not going to get shafted out of this ride mid-season, although this is a one-year deal. Todd Gilliland, again, is racing for his job, but considering his decent runs, Especially when you look at road courses and you look at Martinsville last season. November, in fact, he got stage points and a top 10 finish. I'll tell you, if you're a Todd Gilliland fan or a casual, there's a lot to be optimistic about this program. Ryan Priest doesn't need to play video games because he's already a playable character in real life. 
He has the magic in his bones, like when he sold the mortgage on his house to go NASCAR Xfinity racing with JGR. However, he has yet to prove that he's a natural in the NASCAR Cup Series. You can say some of that is because the equipment hasn't met his skill. Then again, you've got to be stone cold to make it in this modern era of racing, where you have drivers that weren't instilled with Priest's racing etiquette. Last year, Ryan Priest swam with the Sharks and got devoured. That and Stuart Haas Racing continuing to be a disaster made it to where it was like Priest never left JTG. Once again, 2024 relies on the strength of Stuart Haas Racing. Can they get their cars better? However, out of all four of the driver team combinations, I believe the number 41 is the most equipped to go out there and actually get the job done. Just look at what Ryan Priest did at Martinsville in the spring, as well as his string of top 15 finishes to end the year. Okay, maybe you can argue that the 4 and the 14 are higher on the Stuart Haas racing hierarchy. However, with a veteran driver and a veteran crew chief, this is a combo I believe a lot of people are sleeping off. John Hunter Nemechek becomes the latest driver to dominate and lose a Xfinity Series championship in the JGR number 20 to go cup racing the next season. Risk is just something that's part of Nemechek's instinct. In 2020, he gave up the cup opportunity to start at the bottom rung of the Toyota ladder. Now, both he and Ben Bayshore have climbed back up the NASCAR Cup Series ladder with the Legacy Motor Club. Such a high-class, prestigious organization that got some major sponsorship over the offseason. They've got Family Dollar and Dollar 25 Tree with their knockoff Fruit Loops and Honey Nut Cheerios. Yes, that's the sponsorship for an organization with greats like Jimmy Johnson, Richard Petty, and now Matt Kenseth within the fold. Last year was a lame duck year. Everyone was still getting adjusted to their roles in the organization, and obviously they announced their move to Toyota in April. Chevrolet pretty much discarded them to the side as a third tier team. Now, 2024 is the year where Legacy Motor Club needs to step up performance wise because in the NASCAR Cup Series, you need to have the driver, the crew chief, and the equipment in place to become a contender. The number 43 team at the Legacy Motor Club has had that driver in Eric Jones, who has showed again that he is a driver better than the equipment. They have a crew chief in Dave Ellens that actually wants to be here and build something long term. However, even with all the progress in 2022, to begin the year, the 43 found themselves sub 20th to where they had to try to get a bit creative and bend the rules to try to get a little bit faster. After a season killing gateway penalty that put them 30th in points, the two might have thought internally that Jimmy Johnson should be fucking shot. Eric Jones is back in the total. Toyota Pipeline, which he may or may not be excited about considering that they dumped him in 2020. This 43 team is definitely the biggest wild card in this 2024 season. If they can perform how they did at the end of 2023, maybe he wins a race or even points his way into the playoffs. Although this is the 43 and it wouldn't surprise me if yet again they get behind run sub 20th and then try some wacky thing to get a massive penalty to take them out of contention, thus wasting another year of the career of Eric Jones. Tyler Reddick's 2023 at 2311 racing was remarkable considering that he could have easily been stuck in a RCR R&D project instead. Still, for every impressive win Reddick had in 2023, there were at least two to three races where the 45 team, you know what? You blew it! Like with Bubba Wallace, it's all about improving, moving the needle as a driver. Last year, he proved he wasn't a one and done in the playoffs, and considering his talent, Thank God! 2024 is about two things. Number one, Tyler Reddick needs to get better at the short tracks. He's acknowledged that that's his weakness as a driver and he's gonna work at it like Bubba Wallace has on road courses. The second thing is they've gotta start getting their pit stops better because if I were Denny Hamlin and I would wanna try to make 2311 more profitable, I'd honestly get into the pole bearing business because I'm sure there's no shortage of people that have had disappointing lives and just for one more time, they wanna be let down to their final resting place. This is a massive stepping stone year for 2311. Do they take that next step to become championship contenders and dethrone JGR? Or 
Somewhere in year four, does the hype die down and Legacy Motor Club steals the thunder that this organization has? Winning the Daytona 500 changed the entire trajectory of Ricky Stenhouse Jr. and JTG Doherty Racing. All it really took was that prize money and dedication from everyone from Tad and Jody Kashichter to new crew chief Mike Kelly. They brought faster cars and most importantly, the driver, Ricky Stenhouse Jr., did a better job of not overdriving the equipment meaning that those DNFs turned into 15th to 20th place finishes, and it would prove to be statistically one of Stenhouse's better seasons. So there are two things that are going to define whether Ricky Stenhouse Jr. can back up what he did in 2023. As Ricky Stenhouse Jr. himself stated in Phoenix to end the year, JTG is trying hard to focus their efforts into qualifying. It's incredible to see what Ricky Stenhouse Jr. did last year considering that he had a 25th place average start and we all know with the next generation car, track position is a necessity just like water. The second is less of a 47 team issue and more of Chevrolet because most of the Chevy teams fell off in the second half. One of those was the 47 as after they got eliminated from the playoffs, Ricky Stenhouse Jr. quietly reverted back to his old habits. You guys hungry? I'll make Totino's pizza rolls. Yeah, and the flames are just billowing out the right side of that car. The rolls they crave now come in sandwich and Mexican favorites, Totino's rolls. It's how kids help themselves. After receiving and cashing in the check to BB&T for finishing 16th in the owner's points, 2024 is going to be intriguing to see what Ricky Stenhouse Jr. can do with more resources and momentum entering this season. 2023 was the craziest year for Alex Bowman, even more crazier than when he found out that he lost his ride in the Taco Bell parking lot. Alex Bowman went from winning the Hendrick Motorsports Pole Qualifying Invitational to leading the point standings with new crew chief Blake Harris to getting that massive louver penalty, then getting it back and running 8th to 10th in that time. Then he got another 60 point penalty, which put him mid pack in the points. And then obviously he had the massive injury. With back injuries, it's not like what Chase Elliott had, as you really get out of the rhythm in terms of driving, and you could tell that. Alex Alex Bowman was not the same driver for the rest of the year. So for what is it, like the fourth or fifth year in a row, everyone's talking about how Alex Bowman needs to step it up or he's going to be on the hot seat, insert the meme about X to the 48. It's a bit frustrating to see the hate for Alex Bowman because yes, Chase Elliott, Kyle Larson, and William Byron have achieved so much in the last four or five years. Let's not look past what Alex Bowman has achieved. He's made the playoffs every year as a Hendrick Motorsports driver, except for 2023. Sure, I understand and why people might write off Alex Bowman. I've written him off the last two years by not having him making the playoffs. At times, Alex Bowman might be streaky, and then you also have to consider he's the fourth best driver, the 48 is still the fourth best team, even if they're not as bad, and going back to Chevrolet, this might be a downer year. Even then, an Alex Bowman that's the fourth best driver at Hendrick still has the experience and still has the resume of wins and playoff appearances to where he would trump the best driver at Legacy and Stuart Haas, for example. Because of that, I don't think Alex Bowman's going to have too bad of a year compared to what all the fans on X are saying. Justin Haley couldn't bring the sufficient funds to Colleague Racing, so in July, he made a silly season move that just seemed downright silly. Signing a multi-year deal with Rick Ware Racing, also known as the team that makes you question everything in life. The question so many journalists and fans wanted to ask Justin Haley was why? Apparently, Justin Haley was hooked on the dream that Brad Keselowski sold him. Rick Ware Racing has a strong technical alliance with RFK Racing as they do lease out part of RFK's shop. And looking back at the 2023 season, we all know the strength of RFK. Justin Haley is hoping that Rick Ware can help him regain that momentum that he lost at the end of the year. Justin Haley, for how consistent he is, only earned two top 20 finishes after the announcement was made and his tenure at Colleague became a lame duck one. 
So Justin Haley in this season is just hoping to prove that there's more to racing than just chasing money. Many people might critique Ty Gibbs' rookie season. Well, he didn't make the playoffs. He was pretty much a ghost for a majority of the regular season and then had, what, one or two good races? Although, I would say that this was a necessary season for Ty Gibbs. He got into so much controversy in the Xfinity Series and the NASCAR Cup Series, it's a different ballgame. What Ty Gibbs did, which was being quiet and learning how to race in the NASCAR Cup Series, is going to really benefit him in this second season. Now he really has that chance to come into his own in this second season, and you saw that in the clash. Ty Gibbs in 2024 is going to depend on him getting even better as a driver, as well as the 54 team getting better at intermediates. Ty Gibbs did really good at the road courses and short tracks, but the intermediates were his kryptonite. If this team gets better at the Kansases and Charlotte's on the schedule, you guys better look out. I believe if that happens and Toyota can figure out the car in the second half, this might be one of the best sophomore seasons in NASCAR history. You could argue that NASCAR is just like a fitness journey, as for Zane Smith, immediately he turned heads when he could start benching 100 pounds without much practice. Showing this early with his part-time Xfinity schedule with JRM and immediately with GMS Racing. I remember the 2020 Charlotte truck race. He was phenomenal. A breakout race for him in many ways. Then in 2022, he leveled up again with his dominant truck series season that made him forever a NASCAR champion. However, the NASCAR Cup Series is a different leveling up. It's like going from 150 pounds to 300. It's insane. Although there's good reason to believe that Zane Smith won't have any issues. I believe Zane Smith is the modern day Morgan Shepard. You just look at his sponsors. He has Focused Health and Centene Corporation to help him pick out a decent healthcare plan. Then you have Workforce, which is going to help him make sure that he's working in a safe environment. If not, then they're going to get OSHA involved. Then you have WeatherTech. If there's ever any weather issues, whether it's getting to the track or on the track, he is going to have the products necessary to where that's not going to hurt his health. You could argue that Zane Smith is the anti-Kyle Busch and he's going to race well into his 70s, maybe even 80s. In 2024, he'll start year number one of his five-decade Cup Series career, racing a third chartered entry for Spire Motorsports, basically as a track house driver in the wing. So let's say Zane Smith handles the weight properly, you never know, the 99 at track house might await him. If not, there's no need to worry. He's got at least 49 years left in his Cup Series career. He'll continue building strength as a NASCAR Cup Series driver by just getting used to the Sunday field. The health and well-being of Carson Hoshevar should be a concern for the entire NASCAR community, not just because tall people are more likely to have back problems. Jeff Gordon being the outlier to this trend, have you seen how Carson Hosevar carried Nice Motorsports on his back after Ross Chastain left? Carson Hosevar has shown an incredible level of talent in the truck series, but he's made some of the most idiotic moves that have destroyed his reputation. What have I done? It's almost like that one saying, how can a driver be so smart, so talented, yet so stupid at the same time? I don't know what is making Carson Hosevar drive like this. Maybe Alex Jones was right. There's just something in the water that makes these drivers make incredibly stupid decisions. And those stupid decisions aren't going to fly as now Carson Hosevar makes the jump from Friday nights to Sundays. We all know he can run well. Just look at Gateway before his mechanical failure as well as his stint with the Legacy Motor Club. The big key to success is whether Carson Hosevar can clean up his mistakes. This is the NASCAR Cup Series, and if you pull those moves like you did in the Truck Series, you're going to have Joey Logano, Denny Hamlin, or maybe even Martin Truex Jr. teach you a harsh lesson. I believe that Ty Gibbs 2023 is a great blueprint to follow. I don't know if he's reached out or if he's studied how he conducted himself in that year because Carson Hosevar needs to harness that before it gets him into some deep trouble in his rookie year. When Daniel Suarez entered track house in 2021, it was finally a breath of fresh air. Whether it was Joe Gibbs Racing, Stuart Haas, or the Gaunt Brothers, he never had that organization that wanted to build around him and help him develop as a driver. 
With Trackhouse Racing, they've done so much for his career. He got his first win and made the playoffs. However, as we enter this 2024 season, Trackhouse Racing is entering a brand new era. It's getting to the point where Trackhouse is starting to outgrow Daniel Suarez. They have so many drivers under contract. Zane Smith, Shane Van Gisbergen, Connor Zilich, and obviously you have Ross Chastain, which is one of the most frustrating parts about Daniel Suarez. Ever since Chastain got to track house, Suarez has played a sad second fiddle, kinda like how Chase Elliott played a second fiddle to Larson in 2021. Except this one has been recurring, and now in 2024, this is a huge year for Daniel Suarez. He has a brand new crew chief, Matt Swiderski, comes over from Colleague to join the track house 99. And there's going to be a lot of pressure on Daniel Suarez to go out there and perform, which almost concerns me because I believe when Daniel Suarez is under pressure, he tends to make a lot of mistakes. For example, Indy 2019, when he brushed the wall and just could not make up the points gap between he and Ryan Newman, some would argue that it was this race that contributed to Daniel Suarez ultimately losing his job at SHR. Now in 2024, we're going to see if a lot's changed and whether Daniel Suarez can go out there and perform when the pressure is sky high. The 2024 NASCAR schedule is going to have you nostalgic, as gone are some of the new events like the Bristol Dirt Race and the Indy Road Course. Some of the major changes include cold, chilly days in Atlanta, and I've got to applaud NASCAR fans. This is a race called the Am Better Health 400, and based on the tickets sold, it sounds like a lot of people are taking their health awfully seriously. You've got the Bristol Spring Race back, which so far the Bristol team is getting so nostalgic, and I can't wait for the green flag to drop, and all of a sudden we remember those days of rainouts and Bristol being three-fourths empty. Then you've got the return of the Brickyard 400, a race that has clearly lost a lot of interest with some lackluster racing and subpar attendance. I'd say the only good change to the schedule was Iowa, as now, for the first time, we have a short track that's not in the south. Alrighty guys, so we've went over the 34 drivers and the 36 chartered teams, and now it's time to make some 2024 NASCAR Cup Series playoff predictions. I've seen a lot of people when making their playoff picks tend to go for like who was good last year, who has the momentum. Although I believe that storylines are going to influence who is going to make the 16 driver grid. With both Ford and Toyota getting brand new cars, I believe that Chevrolet is going to be putting a strong significance on the first half of the regular season. Because if Ford and Toyota figure things out and Chevrolet gets in a slump, they'll have the summer to kind of try to figure things out before the playoffs. When it comes to the Daytona 500, how can you argue against the numbers? February 18th, 2024 is going to be Chase Elliott's Day of Daytona 500 Destiny, just like it was for Daryl Waltrip in 1989. Chase Elliott's victory is going to set a trend of non-playoff drivers winning races early in the regular season. It's going to be prevalent, especially with Alex Bowman winning Atlanta the week later, as well as Daniel Suarez smashing the second pinata of his career at Circuit of the Americas. Meanwhile, it's hard to argue against both Kyle Larson and William Byron at least winning one race in 2024. In addition, driver talent is so marvelous, and I believe that Ross Chastain as well as Kyle Busch are going to get wins based on what they bring behind the wheel. So would you look at that, we've already got seven Chevrolets in the playoffs, so what happens when Ford and Toyota eventually get better, and they will in the regular season? You've got to look at the obvious. Toyota, namely Joe Gibbs Racing, is going to get some huge victories. Denny Hamlin, Christopher Bell, and Ty Gibbs are all going to win races in the regular season. As for Martin Truex Jr., I believe he goes winless, but he will point his way into the 16 driver field. Tyler Reddick is also an incredible talent that you just cannot keep out of victory lane for long. Believe it or not, that leaves only four spots for the Blue Oval, which will be taken by Joey Logano because that's obvious, it's an even year. Ryan Blaney, who will be a ghost for a majority of the regular season, but he'll pull a win out of his ass somewhere in the summer. Then, I believe the strength of RFK will lead Chris Buescher to his second straight playoff appearance and his third straight with a victory. That leaves one more spot for a surprise winner that nobody is going to expect, and I believe that driver in 2024 is going to be Connecticut's own Ryan Priest. 
people tend to forget that last year, Ryan Priest could have easily won Richmond or Martinsville, but Stuart Haas Racing just didn't have the speed to get him over the hump. I believe that Stuart Haas Racing is going to get better, and that is going to lead to Ryan Priest winning a short track race to punch his ticket into the 16 driver playoffs. So you guys might be surprised that I left out names like Brad Keselowski, Bubba Wallace, Michael McDowell, and Austin Sindrick. However, with NASCAR becoming more like the NFL, I believe there are going to be some good teams that might be 10th to 12th in points that don't get the win and don't make the playoffs, and that's the fate I see for these four drivers. Regardless, this is the year of Jeff Gordon, and I believe we're going to see some incredible things in the next 27 weeks of racing. So I hope you guys enjoyed that video. I believe this is going to be the longest video in NRF Productions history when it's all said and done. Therefore, I'd like to thank you guys for making it to the end. The truck and Xfinity spotters guides are coming soon. Other than that, this is Nathan Ford Digital Gas House. Life's a beach, and then you drive.